Okay, this is Big Rack, and this particular hat goes with my character that I call the Deer Hunter. Okay, we're going to talk about Project Paperclip. Project Paperclip uh, was a United States uh, program that started towards the end of World War II, and it was to bring what we are told primarily was called German um, people of interest into the United States to come to work for American government or American industry, maybe American um, universities. Anybody who was really smart or had really good abilities and things like spying was brought over to the United States. Was there a project paperclip for other enemy countries? Uh, the other enemy countries in those days were, uh, well, the Italians and the Japanese. And what other, uh, what other allies of Germany? Well, the thing was that in just about every country that was against Germany, there were citizens of these countries who were pro Germany, pro Nazi. So, uh, What does it mean? Well, I mean, if you had a government in the United States that was bringing in people of interest from all over the world, regardless of their politics, because they thought they could be used, so that's what we're told is what happened. And these people were among the smartest people in the world. They had maybe some very bad politics. In my opinion, anyway, but maybe in their opinion, they thought that their Nazi fascist politics were good. Anyway, the point of the matter is they were brought into the United States. Now, who else had a Project Paperclip kind of deal going on? Uh, Russia and Great Britain. Maybe every country did. There was a lot of countries that have been open to immigration. Um, you know, pa past World War II. South American countries took in all kinds of Europeans. Australia has taken in all kinds of immigrants. Canada has taken in all kinds of immigrants. Modern day European countries have had a stampede of Refugees. The point of the matter is, what is the point of the matter? Well, the government was trying to actually bring in certain people, and other ones have come. Now, who have we got in our countries? So, what happens when you bring people into the country? Uh, well, those people get busy and uh, maybe they bring their family over, they have children, uh, the children are brought up in the, under the family culture. And I don't know, let's say someone of this group comes in. I mean, it doesn't have to be. It could be that we, there's already people, as I said, in your country that have got these Nazi fascist um, feelings, um, highly racist into eugenics, which is um, sterilizing people that they don't want to breed. Very much control over the population, um, having an elite who rules and gets the fruit of ruling. In other words, they get all the goodies. So what happens if one of these people becomes, let's say, for example, a member of your police? Well, in uh, Nazi Germany, they had multiple kinds of police, not just one kind of police. And the ones that we saw on Hogan's Heroes, I don't know if you've seen Hogan's Heroes, it was late 1960s television show that uh, was about a group of 
um, allied prisoners of war in a German prison of war camp. And anyway, there was Major Hochstetter, who was a member of the Gestapo. The PO on the end means the police. Some people know the slang term for police is the popo. So the Gestapo were pretty much uh, ideological police. In other words, they were enforcing Nazi ideology and they were basically... In Russia, they also had these kind of ideological police. They were called commissars. And they were basically to look at if what you were doing, say, well, even maybe in, I don't know, in the military, you would have these political officers who were watching you, and the political officers weren't really involved too much in the fighting, but they were watching what you were doing because you were a fighting unit. And they were looking to disloyalty to the Communist Party. And they would report not through you, but they report through their own hierarchies. Anyways, it's quite a spider's web. And even today, in our Western countries, we've got all kinds of secret police. We've been told by Edward Snowden that we've got things like the NSA that spy on our cell phones. The Five Eyes group is five countries that have got laws against spying on their own citizens, but no laws against spying on foreign citizens. So, basically what it is, it's Australia, New Zealand, Canada, the United States, and Great Britain. So, the Canadian government cannot spy on Canadian citizens, but the American government can because they're foreign citizens. So the Americans spy on Canadian citizens, pass that information on to the Canadian government. Ditto for, I don't know, pick one, Great Britain spies on Australian citizens, for example. The Five Eyes Group, it's a way to get around the laws on the books that prohibit uh, spying on your own citizens by the government. How does that strike you? Does it seem like it's illegal? Highly illegal, because it is against the spirit of these laws. (coughs) (coughs) Okay, back to my cold. What else do we know about colds? Okay, I hope you can see this. It says Green Party. I don't have anything to go with it right now. It's just election time and the Green Party are running. Um, Okay, I just wanted to finish up with the idea of uh, Project Paperclip influence people in your police. Um, uh, Does it mean that they think that they're above the law? They are the law? Well, they pretty much implement the policies that they want. They pass the laws and then the idea of the spirit of the law versus the letter of the law. Um, what does it mean? Well, the spirit of the law is, you know, interpreting the law, because the words are hard to cover every possibility. And if you have a judge who's judging things based upon the spirit of the law, they're going to be... Um, trying to look at the huge context of everything and what this law is supposed to be preventing. They're supposed to be using their intuition. And then you have other kinds of judges who are um, strict, strictly following what the words in the law say. So they're looking for technicalities that uh, a accused can get off on. This is a technicality, and they're not looking at the spirit of the law at all. Who's better? I suppose it depends on what spirit the judge is in. 
if the judge is trying to get to uh, higher wisdom, higher consciousness, um, or whether the judge is a hanging judge and just wants to go and uh, be a law and order kind of judge, in other words, well, I, regardless of the circumstances that led you to speeding to the hospital because your wife was about to have birth, uh, we're giving, gonna, you were cited for a speeding ticket and you're going to get to have to pay that speeding ticket. Where someone else might say, it's an emergency, she was about to pop and she had to get to the hospital right away. So that's why uh, the husband was speeding and, you know, the spirit of the law is an emergency. Vehicles are allowed to go fast. They're supposed to put on sirens and things, but all in all, that's what a judge has got to look into when they're been told that the speeding ticket is improper. Now, I told you this hat, big rack, is what I call the deer hunter. And here's a synchronicity I have seen. This is a little work vehicle fixing the roads, and it's a deer. And there's a symbol of the deer, etc., etc. Someone has left garbage all over the front of this area. And what I saw was this number right here, 100. 100. What it means, I don't know yet. I'm going to keep it in mind and see if something 100 happens. Oh, I've also got my Angel Numbers book. So give me a moment. Okay, this is my Angel Numbers book by Doreen Virtue. And this is 100. Okay, it says, this is a strong message from God telling you that your positive thoughts are necessary to co-create the outcome you desire. So that's what I'm going to use for my hundred angel numbers. Now, I was trying to figure out what my deer hunter would do in the situation of a bunch of oversouls who are playing games and um, making people on earth uh, pay their debts. Okay, my next hat is age. So I would say to these oversouls and supervisors, monads, etc., what's your age again? In other words, why are you playing childish games and making humans have to be your pawns in a great game of chess that you're playing another dimension? Because it certainly feels like that's what's going on many times. Why are you acting like you're seven years old? Uh, this gets us back to the famous book that I talk about from time to time by Robert Durop. It's uh, called Beyond the Drug Experiences. And it's, what's the second? The secondary title is Some Games People Play. So Durop says that there are three major groupings of games people play. There are low games which are things like pigs in the trough, which is basically you being a pig trying to get as much for you as you can. Uh, the Moloch game, which is basically being a mercenary, in other words, killing for money. Uh, there's other ones. The middle game is basically the householder game. The householder game is basically as I was saying in an earlier, uh, the game of payday, where you get a job, your wife gets a job, and uh, you bring up children, and you have all the bills to pay, and you try and pay your way. It's called a middle game because that's all you're doing in this game. It's not a really low consciousness game. But it's not a game that's advancing your personality, advancing your consciousness. It's basically the same game every day. We go to work, we come home, look after the kids, go to bed, and do it over again and over again and over again for a whole lifetime. Uh, other games that are maybe high game, hmm, it's 
kind of difficult to say it's really higher than the payday game. It's basically the religion game. And it's not very... Well, in some countries, it's not hardly played at all. But in some parts of some countries, let's call it the Bible Belt, certain countries, it's still being played. And that's where you've got religion. And you've got people whose job is to promulgate their religion. Promulgate means they've got to keep the religion going. So it's basically another payday kind of job because you go and you see your pastor and you ask him to look at the scriptures to interpret what you should do in your day-to-day life. So you're looking to an outside authority to give you guidance And, you know, the churches want you to tithe 10% of your salary to the church. And maybe pay an honorarium to the pastor to perform marriage ceremonies, baptisms, uh, funerals, etc. So, it's still a game, and it's, it's because you're using a book. Some people say it's the Word of God, and I'm going to say... Well, if it's the Word of God, how come God didn't sign it? If I open up the Bible, why is it that the the words on the page just don't vibrate in, like, fire or something? Why is it that, why don't they just burn my eyes? No, they're just regular print on paper. I can go to read um, Edgar Allan Poe and some of his horror books, and it looks like the same um, print on paper as the Bible. So, I mean, if this is really the Word of God, shouldn't it just make me shake in my boots that I'm holding this thing? That's what a logical person would say. But there are these institutions called churches, temples, mosques, etc., etc., all kinds of holy men that you go to see. So anyway, they call, Durop calls this perhaps a high game, but it's still not the highest game. And that is the primary title of his book. It's called The Master Game. What is The Master Game? Well, it's basically what some people do uh, as an offshoot to the religion game. And sometimes something what happens to people who uh, maybe did LSD or something back in the flower child days of the late 1960s. It may be someone like Eckhart Tolle, Eckhart Tolle, who was having major anxiety and uh, the anxiety got to the point where his intuition kicked in and he uh, had a spiritual awakening out of his intense pain and discomfort. But anyway, the point of the the matter is, it's basically an ascension. You had a big leap of consciousness, so you were no longer going to the religionist and the Bible or the Torah or the Quran to look for what it says to do and you start following your own internal guidance system. Some people say you have connected yourself to God, or you have connected yourself to Source, to Higher Wisdom, to the Tao, all these other words. That is the master game, and that is the game that you all should be playing. I hate to use the word should, because I don't like being told what to do either. However, If you are going to advance your consciousness in this lifetime, uh, you have to play the master game. Otherwise, you've wasted your life. What do you mean I've wasted my life, you know? I've had lovely trips around the world, the Caribbean, I've been to Japan. You know, I've got a good job, I teach children. I do good work, I fix cars for people, they need their cars fixed. The point of the matter is, if you want to advance your conscience... Oh, I read a lot. In my spare time, I read a lot. Is it good? Well, if you're reading spiritually uplifting books...
I golf a lot, it's peaceful. Okay, you golf a lot and you have peace on the golf course. But how does that uh, reflect on what you do when you're not on the golf course? I mean... Why is it that play, people that play a lot of golf don't, you know, talk about meditation and following their own guidance system? There are some actors that do, you know, like Jim Carrey or Russell Brand. They talk about um, the way that they do things and the way they see things. Keanu Reeves sometimes is said to do these things, but Jim Carrey is quite often on the meme. Russell Brand does talks. Okay, my new hat is a Thunderbird. And my new shirt is Think Differently. Okay, what else do we want to talk about? Uh, I want to talk about Pleiadians. Pleiadians are these theoretical extraterrestrials from another group of stars, constellation of Pleiades. And the Pleiadian teachings are brought to you by people like Barbara Marciniak, uh, who said that a bunch of people they called star seeds came to incarnate as humans to help with Earth ascension. Ascension is going to higher consciousness. If you want to know what's higher on in consciousness, you can look at the scale of human consciousness, which is available on the internet. Um, let's see. Now, if we're going to think differently, I got a whole pile of crows down here going crazy. Okay. Crows to me mean magic. Magic in the air. Okay, if we go back to the idea that the, the codes of information in your local hologram, also known as the etheric or your aura, well, how is it that magic can happen when you see magicians do things that are clearly beyond what normal humans can do? They have to have codes in their local hologram in order to do what they're doing. I guess I'm talking about real magic, not just someone who's very good with their hands at, you know, doing card tricks by moving cards around surreptitiously. Or is it that all of you who are watching The Magician have got codes inserted into your auras to make you see things that aren't happening? Okay, I was going to go back to the idea that other beings who are playing games, a money game, basically, uh, where they want you to buy their stuff. Well, okay, the example is I'm in the business of cold remedies and infection remedies, in other words, big pharma. And I want people to buy these products. So, uh, quietly in the lab, I'm going to be manufacturing new flu bugs and new cold viruses. Is it so far-fetched? Is it possible that by me going to medical school, I'm putting it out to the universe that I want sick people to come to see me? In other words, it makes some people sick so that I can have a medical practice. This seems kind of foolish because, uh, you know, in the human realm, someone who's, let's say, 20 years old 
who is thinking about going into medical school knows there are plenty of sick people on the planet and uh, you know the old doctors are going to need to retire and um, have to be replaced so new ones are going to have to be trained why not me that is a certain way of looking at it but I want you to look at it metaphysically Metaphysically, if you are going and taking medical training, you are putting it out to the universe that, um, what, I just want to learn this stuff, I'm never going to use it? Or are you putting it out there, I want you to create some sick people so I can have a medical practice? Does it depend, depend on your level of consciousness? I mean, it goes and goes and goes. You open a store and you're selling stuff. You want customers. So a lot of people will say, well, I want to use The Secret or something, some of these old movies on metaphysics to bring me customers. Basically, are you not telling the universe? Do some magic and uh, make some people come to me and buy from me? Is this not the same as a witch's spell? A hex? You're hexing people to come and see you. I'm going to say it is. I'm going to say all of these things that are about you improving your life or getting some result that you want to see. Then in Buddhism, these are known as attachments. Attachments to desires. The Buddhist teachers say um, you have to release your attachments and release your need for to have desires. Then what are you going to do? Uh, then you're going to be enlightened and you're going to be helping people to ascend to higher consciousness and help us get rid of horrible, horrible things like hexes and spells that are making people do things they don't really want to do but you know, somebody else has put an order in for the universe your liver. These are all the pros. This is all the magic. Think differently. Stop doing spells. If you are a doctor, how are you going to remedy your situation? Well, at the end of the day, are you looking at your pocketbook to see how much money you pulled in today? If you are, you are casting spells to create people to come to your practice so you can fill your pocketbook. In other words, are you serving yourself? Are you serving others? Are you blending it?